All right, well, thanks very much to Dan and Yvonne for inviting me to come speak to you at your annual meeting tonight. And it's my pleasure to come back to Riverside and present for you tonight. I was born in Oak Park Hospital, but as soon as they let me out of there, I came to the apartments across the street. I don't remember a thing from that, but we moved down to Berry Point Road where I had uh, a purely uh, magical and idyllic childhood in Riverside. And one might ask, did any of my experiences in Riverside pave the way for me to give this ecology presentation tonight? And in a way, there were a few things. Down at the corner of uh, Berry Point and Fairbanks Road, there was a tree that went up at an angle and had a million branches in it. And I would just spend hours and hours and hours climbing that tree. I also would go down to the river and check the water levels all the time in comparison to how much they forecast rain, how much did. So I was starting to get a bit of an ecology background back in Riverside, but I really got hooked more and more onto ecology as I got a little bit older. But let's look at our topic for tonight. Our topic is the gem of Chicago wilderness, ecology and restoration of the greatest ecological region of the US. Now that phantasmagoric kind of title might seem like a bit of a tall task to convince you all, uh, but we'll make a, an effort at doing that with these four primary goals. We want to quantify our ecological gem. How is it that we're the big kahuna in terms of ecology in the United States and also convey how it came to be? Then we're going to illustrate several examples, habitat examples of our ecological gem. And all throughout the presentation, I'll be emphasizing restoration potential of our ecological gem. And then the fourth overall goal is to get everyone excited about working in restoration of this ecological gem. Kind of like the old Hans and Franz skit on Saturday Night Live, we're going to pump you up in order to get more excited about restoration. I didn't start out uh, in this mold as an ecologist. I started out as an animal ecologist studying spotted salamanders. And they, as you can see, are on the edge of the rain, range in Chicago wilderness. So they're not very many around here, but further east and south, they're very common. They lay their egg masses in wetlands, their larvae hatch out, engage in predator-prey interactions. And we study them in these cages in ponds. And I did that for over a quarter of a century. And back then I used to think that if a habitat was green, it was good. But people started waking me up to the fact that green isn't always good if the green is non-native plants from Europe, Eurasia, or Asia. Those plants tend to degrade our system, so I committed myself to start to learn more and more about that. So what is Chicago Wilderness? There's a consortium of conservation entities that uh, can be learned more about at chicagowilderness.org, but the basic geographic uh, realm of Chicago wilderness is a kind of an ame amoeba shaped area, but it's basically uh, determined by drainages. You have the Kankakee River going on the south part, joining in with the Illinois River. You can see the Des Plaines River coming down, DuPage River coming down, Fox River coming down and joining the Illinois River. And then there's also, I think, a, a little bit of it going over to the Rock River, but it's, it's basically based on drainages. The dark green spots up there are present nature preserves, and Chicago Wilderness has about 550,000 acres of nature preserves in it. The green is, the light green is possibly restorable habitat, so we could have even more. The tan and the pale color are either farmland or urban uh, blot. So we can't really do anything with those. And there's always something fun happening in Chicago wilderness. In the lower left and upper right, we have short eared owls and rough legged hawks that were seen at Kankakee Sands Nature Preserve on the Indiana Illinois border. And then in the lower right, we have a white faced ibis that was found at Kankakee Sands uh, last April. They're more common out in Nebraska, but apparently they came through Chicago wilderness and thought this was a great place to hang out for a while. So there's always something good happening in Chicago wilderness. Now it's not going forward. Oh, I see. So now we have to quantify how it is that we are the ecological gem of the United States. And the basic way you do it is by the diversity of native plant species and how much production there is. Because these plants form 
the foundation to any ecosystem. All energy has to come from the plants and the more different kinds of plants you have and the greater biomass of plants you have, the better animal food web you can have and many other features of the system. So how do we rank? Well, we fortunately have this very heavy book if you're into exercise, this is a good one to pick up. Some of you have it, some of you have seen it. If you haven't, it's called The Flora of the Chicago Region. And if you go by it, through it page by page, you find out that the Chicago area has 1,867 native plant species. Now, some botanists might quibble a little bit with that number because some of those plants are so rare that they're for all practical purposes extinct. But still, it's around 1,800 species. And we have good production, even though it's cold out there now and the plants aren't growing, it will warm up and it will rain a fair amount. So we have good production of our plants. So let's compare that total then to the best national park. So your favorite national park might be Adirondack National Park, Smoky Mountains, Yellowstone, Yosemite, you name it. But the best one is Grand Canyon National Park at 1,500 and some change. So we, and they have lower production because it doesn't rain as much there. So we kind of kicked the National Park Service in the behind a bit there and we're better And Chicago. Remember that Chicago wilderness has only 550,000 acres, which is actually a lot for an urban area of nine and a half million. But the Grand Canyon National Park is 1.2 million acres in size. So we went on, on all these metrics and you can look up the analysis on Chicago Nature now dot com and you'll see the the uh, story well how did we so we've conquered the first topic already so if you're thinking about uh, you know when you get out of here it's like we're, we're moving along pretty well well we haven't quite we haven't quite finished the first topic the first half of the first topic so how did we get this great biodiversity and as you can imagine it's all about location so we're located at the southern tip of lake michigan as you know so we have weather influences coming up from the south. And we kind of notice those most in July when we have hot, humid weather. But last month, we had a very mild December dominated by summer flows, uh, southern flows. And we set a couple of record highs because we had weather from there. So there's lots of plants from the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast that also like us. Then we sometimes have air masses coming from the west, which are mild and drier. So we have plants from the Great Plains that bind our area good. And then we have air masses coming down from the north. We notice them most again in a month like this in January where we've had some single digit temps, but they can come any time of the year. So there are plants from the upper Great Lakes in Canada that really like our area. So it's about location, but also the fact that we had glaciers come down several times and most recently they were here and left about 18,000 years ago. So we see a valley glacier on the left and it looks all dirty. These glaciers carry a lot of stuff, rocks, boulders, sand, silt, clay, lots of different materials. And when the ice melts, it lays it down in a mosaic. So Chicago wilderness has sand in some places, clay, silt, uh, boulders, rocky, we have bedrock nearby. You can see that in the Thornton quarries when you're on the tri-state. But Theodore Stone Prairie over here in countryside is scraped out right to the bedrock there. But in other places, the bedrock is way down there. So we have a, a continental glacier on the right and Willis Tower would look like a toothpick next to that thing. These, these glaciers were big. They would bowl over the whole city of Chicago if they came back. But they lay down again. Here's a fan of what looks to be Sometimes there's a fan of sand, sometimes it looks to get silty like it is there. Just a, a great mosaic of soil types and undulations in the, uh, in the landscape. So here's, here are just a few examples. Lechia is a plant that is, that its core of its center range is the sweltering heat of Arkansas, Louisiana, uh, southern Missouri, but it finds our area okay. Prairie drop seed in the top middle loves the central plains over there in Iowa, but it finds us okay. A rush in the upper right hand corner likes the coastal plain and the Gulf Coast, but it's also up in our area. Then we have a sedge that kind of likes the upper Great Lakes in Canada, but finds our area just fine in the middle. We have something called cow wheat, which is classic boreal plant of, of the upper peninsula in Canada, but we, we have it here. Then Senna is kind of in the Appalachians, is the core of its range, but it's here as well. 
on the lower left is, uh, is jack pine, I think it is. So jack pine is a classic northern species, but we have it, and birch, paper birch, a classic northern species, but we have it as well. We could go all night with hundreds and hundreds of species showing how we get them from the south, the west, the north, and all different ways they, they overlap here quite a bit. And it's really just a crazy quilt of habitats. Now this is for Northwest Indiana, but you could do the same thing in our area. Of course, most of it is urban now, but you, if you dissect that out and look at the nature preserves, it's, it's really a, a, an amazing quilt of conditions. How do you find out about these preserves? You all have your favorite ones, but there are probably about 400 nature preserves in Chicago wilderness. And you don't have to ever go on vacation anywhere else. You can just stay here and go, go up to McHenry or Woodstock and stay in the Bill Murray uh, Groundhog Day uh, bed and breakfast now and go visit their nature preserves and that. But here's just a listing of some of them. We have some land trusts in Chicago wilderness area through the Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy, the Nature Conservancy, the Indiana DNR of nature preserves. Illinois has the same thing in it. Every county park system in the Chicago area scores about an A plus in nature. Every other city in, on the planet wishes they had as many county nature preserve systems as we have and how good they are. And uh, we're thanks to people like Daniel Burnham and Jens Jensen and some others back a hundred years ago or more. They, they're the ones who had this vision for us. And, uh, I don't know if I, I I'm, I'll be short on time, so I better not go visit them, but just, you can go to any one of them, just go to McHenry County District. McHenry County's webpage is great. They got a, an owl that <laughs> looks at you and turns its head, but I'm afraid I, I don't want to go into that now, but uh, in Illinois and Indiana DNR State Parks, Illinois Beach State Park is a botanical wonder up there on, this, on the border of Wisconsin and Illinois, Indiana Dunes National Park, and you can learn about all kinds of habitats from this webpage at Michigan uh, State University. But let's now look, so we have conquered that first one now. So let's look at, at some of the sample kinds of habitats that we have that are so special here. And the first one I'm gonna cover is dune and swale. And many of you here in the Western suburbs might not have ever heard of this because you don't have it here. The closest that you have to here is in the South suburbs of Chicago. Chicago and then more common in Northwest Indiana. But if we look on the left here, we see an aerial photo from about 1930 of West Gary and East Chicago, Indiana. And you see that ribbing, that washboard kind of look to it. The lighter colors are sand dunes that are about this tall, five feet, four feet tall. And then the dark spot, the dark parallel lines are wetlands, which we call swales. So at one point there were over a hundred of these ridges, dune ridges, four to five feet tall, and then a swale going through. Of course, we started, as you can see from the next two pictures, we started developing and almost obliterated it off the landscape, but it's, there's still some of it present. And on the right, you can see the parallel low dunes, sometimes like in the lower center there, it's a sunny habitat. Sometimes it's kind of shady. In there, and the bottom right hand picture shows uh, one of the largest aggregations of a carnivorous plant I've ever seen. You've all heard about carnivorous plants, but here's one where there are thousands of them in this one swale. How did dune and swale form this hundred plus rows of dunes? They first of all form in uh, embayments to the Great Lakes, so it has to be a bit of an embayment. And then follow, look. Uh, take out in your mind the blue lines and put in only the black ones. So you can see the dunes undulating and then the swale in between and then follow the black line. It's a beach going to the horizontal black line, which is the uh, Lake Michigan water level. So that's at any given point in time since the glaciers left and after Lake Chicago left. Then the lake goes down for a period of 10 or 20 years. So that's the blue line. So now the water's gone down that makes the beach much longer and sand can pile up and form a new dune. And then you get a new swale. And this happened like 140 times in the Calumet region. Now here you can see an aerial photo of Indiana Dune State Park and you can kind of see on the beach a new dune ridge forming, but they don't form those parallel bands because it wasn't an embayment. And plus the Northwest winds are very strong and they're gonna pile up big dunes and you've all been to Warren Dunes and Indiana Dunes so you know about that. 
Now, here's some more of the, of the ecology of these dunes. Now, on the left, we have a very wide swale and you can see different shades of green there. So there's different plant communities spread out throughout this wide swale. And then it turns into kind of an oak woodland. In the middle, we have pictures that have less of an oak woodland or what we'll learn in a moment is a savanna. And then the lower central is kind of almost like a prairie there. So this dune and swale is highly diverse depending on how much sun is there and what the nature of the water is. And on the right, we have a couple of species of lady slippers orchids. And in the Chicago wilderness area, we have about 42, I don't know, no, it's not 42. Uh, I'll say it's maybe more like, I, I forgot to count it up. I'll say 25 species of orchids in, in there. That number's not right. I have to penalize myself and read the big heavy book later on, <laughs> on that one. But the lady slippers orchids were present in downtown Gary, Indiana by the tens of thousands. Uh, in 1900, and then the city was founded in 1906, so most of them are gone. But there used to be downtown Gary, tens of thousands of orchids like those that are shown there, and they're still left in some of the dune and swale habitat. So uh, to emphasize this diversity, on the, on the left you can see there's a trail that goes from the parking lot in the lower right, this is a dune and swale nature preserve, and then it loops back around. So I took my class one day there in June of a year, a few years back, and we counted every plant species we could identify on the lower trail. And then we came back around thinking that we would find the exact same species on the upper trail because they both looked like the picture at the right. The habitat looked exactly the same, but we found the plant species were 25% different in that little micro difference. And then you add in all these other differences that I've told about these variations. And that's how you get the 1,800 plant species here. Here's another dune and swale. The horizontal line at the bottom is the Indiana Toll Road. And so you can see this from the Indiana Toll Road. Uh, I had my class there working one day, helping to prepare the site for a, a burn. And my wife drove by to, she had to go up to the University of Chicago Hospital. And at first she told me she thought there was a chain gang working on, the, on there, but it turned out it was my class. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, that is a wonderful preserve. You can see some of the dune and swale up on the right. And then uh, on the lower left, you see the Bishop Ford Expressway going on the left side. And to the right of that is Sand Ridge Nature Preserve in uh, Lansing, I think it is. So there's some in Illinois as well, but not as much. It's mostly in Indiana. Okay, now I... Not quite sure why we're not moving. I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. You are seeing no. I don't know why it's. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Okay, so I do want to mention a, a little bit more. Sorry about that delay. On the dune and swale habitat. On the border of Gary, Indiana, and I think it's East Chicago, is a nature preserve in it called Clark and Nine Pine Nature Preserve. And in, 19, in the early 1950s, the preeminent botanist of Indiana's whole history, Charles C. Dean, came to visit this site in his 80s. And he said, I've collected in every township in the state of Indiana, every township, I don't know how many that is, it's a lot. I am now in my 80s. This is the finest Indiana natural area I've ever seen in my life. And it's here in Chicago wilderness. Okay, let's move on to, to Savannah habitat. Now we spell it without the H on the end. So if you ever are referring to savannas of the Midwestern US, don't put the H on there. No H on it. We have two kinds of savanna. We have black oak savanna and bur oak savanna. The picture on the left is a black oak savanna. These are found on sandy soils. So they're very common in Indiana, much less common in, in Northeast Illinois. On the right are two pictures of a bur oak savanna. And uh, those are uh, more on a clay soil and they're more common in Illinois than they are in Northwest Indiana. Now in the center picture, that burrow is easily over 220 years old. And bur oaks re require about six hours or more of sunlight a day. So we know that in about 1800 or earlier, so a few years before Aaron Burr shot Alexander Hamilton, that tree was little and it was growing with at least six hours of sunlight. On the right, 
there's a Baroque about the same age, but it has multiple stems. So again, right around 1800, there was probably a fire that killed the top part of the Baroque and made it sprout up new sprouts from that. So we can still read a little bit into the landscape. But as you drive by the forest preserves here, when you see a bur oak, you'll see that it, it's in a congested forest now. It can't possibly recruit anymore. So we know that our savannas were open and had a lot of sun in the 1700s up to about 1800, because we can age, age things like that. We're lucky in Northwest Indiana because on the left we have Merrillville, Indiana. Then we have I-65 going down to Indianapolis. You've gone on that speed trap before, that death-defying speed trap. And then on the right is Hobart, Indiana. And there's a bunch of land there that never got developed, but it has some bur oaks left in it. So it has some remnant degraded bur oaks. And we're now trying to make up for lost time and get those restored. And so if we could get maybe one out of every 1,000 residents of Lake County, Indiana to come out and help with the work days, that would work wonders. Now you might think to yourself, hey buddy, aren't you aiming kind of low with that one out of a thousand people coming? But that would be 500 people coming for a work day, which would be great to help restore those, those uh, Baroque savannas. Now, let's remember though that these savannas are part of a gradient. So the black on the map is kind of a boomerang shaped location showing the prairie to forest transition zone in pre-settlement conditions. So a prairie is gonna be almost completely without woody plants, maybe a scattered tree here and there, but it's gonna have a lot of grass and a lot of showy flowers in it. A savanna is gonna have maybe 20 to 50% cover of trees and then a lot of prairie-like elements. A woodland is going to be maybe 50 to 80 percent covered by trees with some prairie elements and then a forest will be completely forested except for where there was a blowdown or some kind of other uh, disturbance. Now some of you might have heard of this book called Above Chicago and it was published in 1992 and they have a picture above Riverside in it and they have my house there and I can look at it now and I can see in front of the, and I drove by the Brockus's house a few days ago and there's a giant bur oak there. So all these uh, maroon shaped things are bur oak. So you can see there's a grove of them, a few groves. So Riverside was largely a bur oak savanna in many places or an oak woodland. And then you see a few pages earlier, they show the huge Palis preserves that you've been, you know, where the toboggan slide used to be. And they all have that same color. So it was all oak savanna, oak woodland down there as well. So we can still again read these, these aspects of, of our past history, even though nine and a half million people here, and we've been kind of bulldozing the bejesus out of everything. Now, so the plants, this is a tiny sampling of those 1,800 plants. And you can see they line up, some of them prefer prairie, some don't mind prairie and savanna, all the way down to just forest. But if you make that list 1,800 long, they're all fall out along that gradient or are in wetlands. And the animals do the same thing. They follow that gradient as well. So here are just a few quick pictures of some other savannas. Here's black oak, savanna, Gary, Indiana, Miller, Woods. And you can see the basic layout, how there's little groves of trees and an open prairie-like elements. Fire is an important thing. This is Marquette Park in Gary. And of course, all our savannas in Illinois and Indiana get some level of fire in there. They're uh, great. There's a prairie border uh, nature preserve. And this shows that gradation perfectly that I'm talking about. And every time you go visit your nature preserves around here, look for this gradation because it was so common in Chicago wilderness. The problem is Smokey the Bear stopped fire for a long time. And so a lot of it grew back as thick woodland. And so you, they're trying to restore it back to this, but there's a sign right in the front there. And then there's a tall grass prairie Then it grades into a wetland. In this September view, the wetland had dried up and then grades into a savanna and in the far back of woodland. So that prairie, wetland, savanna, woodland mosaic should be all over the Chicago wilderness area. In Kankakee County, Pembroke Savannah is a great uh, savanna. And again, you can see it has prairie elements, savanna, woodland elements, zigzagging throughout the preserve. One of the biggest restoration problems in savannas though, to, 
right now is stump sprouting. We saw with the bur oak that survived the fire, multiple stems, it's a natural phenomenon, the stump sprouting. But for some reason, in the last 10 or 15 years, it's gone haywire in many of our savannas. So a lot of our savannas, you can just look at the top part of the left picture, you can see the open tree view to it, the savanna idea, but then it's, it's, it's blinded by the stump sprouts of black oak and sassafras. Now, if you look on the right, they had a recent burn there, so that top kills the stump sprouts. So the brown little clumps are black oak stump sprouts coming up again. In the back, the gold is sassafras doing the same thing. The red is, is blueberry there. So what happens now in our preserves is they toggle between these two pictures. We burn them and they go to the right and then five or six years later, they look like the left again. So we're now scratching our heads trying to figure out how this happened and how we can kind of put it back to natural because the old photographs, the old daguerreotypes from the 1800s that show that we had open savannas don't show this happening very much. So we know it's kind of a weird time. Here's that here, they really get to see it. Uh, so right here, there, before the fire, there was one five foot tall black oak coming up. The fire top killed it and gave us three new stems. The next fire is gonna give us five stems and it's just gonna bush in like crazy and kind of degrade the system. You can see how choked up it is on the left, but here's one that's more natural. This is on a south facing slope. So it faces right into the hottest sun and it's a little harder for the trees to get going there. So that's a bit more of a natural savanna. Uh, I just want to show one of the most beautiful black oak savannas in Chicago wilderness called Liverpool Nature Preserve, just a stunning small nature preserve. These people across the street, I hope they know what kind of a, of a gold mine they have across the street. Middle Fork Savannah in Lake County, Illinois. Again, you see this idea, prairie in the front foreground, wetland going back to prairie, woodland, pack, uh, savannah patches, woodland. Here they're working on some restoration in a, in a savanna. Rollins Savannah, I forgot where that one is, just that that's a May picture, just beautiful. Hickory Creek Barrens in Will County, the people of Will County they have a great nature preserve system. You can see the burn marks on these trees. They really burned that up good. Uh, not that long ago, but that you can see the open, great, the gradation is really obvious there. And then Braidwood Dunes and Savannah Nature Preserve in Will County again. You have prairie land, shrub land, savanna land, woodland. It's all there. It's all there. And savannas are beautiful all year. Here's some autumn views of some savannas. And then my favorite picture of all. If any of you have a birthday coming up anytime soon, ask for this if you don't already have it. My Journey into the Wilds of Chicago by Mike McDonald. Uh, so there it is. I don't get anything out of these advertising his book. You, you know, he, he just, just Google that. You'll find his webpage. And that's a great present. I think it's the best nature coffee table book I've ever seen. I'm a little bit of a homer, but I, I think it is the best one. Look at this. So we have a wet prairie in the foreground, grading to sort of a mesic prairie to savanna and then woodland. It's all right there and it's in its beauty. What, okay, so water, let's go to Waterfall Glen in uh, DuPage County Forest Preserves. Here's the other big problem with woodland and savanna restoration is Asian honeysuckle present. So you look up at the top of the trees while you're running along the path here. Looks great, looks like a great savanna woodland, but then this whole thing is an Asian honeysuckle there, completely obliterating the bottom zone. Same thing here, here's your trail, you'll run down and look at that Asian honeysuckle. Now here's a patch they've been restoring at Waterfall Glen. You can see a variety of flowers and then there's the Asian honeysuckle line, which hopefully they're gonna work on next year in this thing. So we, we gotta get as many volunteers as we can because we can't pay enough people to do it. Now we'll give Bryce Harper $300 million to try to hit a baseball, but we won't give anything to try to fix up our nature preserves in, in the greatest ecological area in the country. Nothing against Bryce Harper, but that's just, I just picked on that. Now, so Savannah then to Woodland, maybe up to 80%. And these are from the Palos area near the old uh, toboggan slide. 
thousands of acres of heroic work to open up those woodlands from those European and Asian shrubs and other, other things too, not just them. You can walk all day in these preserves and see these wonderful oak woodlands and oak savannas and they're trying to work on them. One day we were there and we saw Tony Preckwinkle walking through the woods with a hovering group of 20 somethings around her in orbit, I think. And we, we think that that was a crew of restoration folks showing her what the, the efforts were, hoping that she would continue to fund them. That's what I'm guessing it was, but I don't know for sure. I didn't go over there and interrupt her, her parade. And then just right over here on 31st Street, Salt Creek Woods Nature Preserve is dedicated by the state of Illinois, not just part of the Cook County Forest Preserve District, but it's, it gets a higher level of designation. And again, there it is, prairie grading into woodlands there. Well, let's get into tall grass prairie now. So then the, the, the green is the tall grass prairie zone. West of that is shorter grass prairies. It rains a little bit more. You can see the best tall grass prairie is in eastern Kansas. It's almost been obliterated in Illinois and Indiana, but we're making strides and coming back. Now, the, a good, uh, so tall grass prairie, about three fourths of the biomass is gonna be grass, but that may only be 20 or 30 species of plants. 25% of the biomass is going to be these flowers, and there can be hundreds of those species in there. And that's why the prairie is a special kind of grassland. Think back to your last time you saw a video of a lion chasing a gazelle on the Serengeti of Africa. Did a lot of flowers go flying by when they were chasing after them? No, it was all grass. Most grasslands on earth are overwhelmingly grass. Ours are overwhelmingly flowers if they're healthy. And so that's why we give them the word prairie, which is derived from French from the uh, uh, Paramartet. So this prairie is called the Gensburg Markham Prairie. And if you are taking the tri-state over into Indiana and you're about, to, you're one mile from the last toll, it'll be on your right. It's a national natural landmark. It gets, it's the highest level of, pres, of protection of any kind of nat nature area in the country. National natural landmark. It's a miracle it's still there. And then a couple other local prairies in Chicago wilderness. My favorite now is Soane Prairie in Northbrook. Now Northbrook has three nature preserves right next to each other. I'm gonna go with you. On the, on the west is Soane Prairie and the middle is Soane Prairie Grove. So that's gonna be a mix of prairie and savanna. So anything with grove means it was once a savanna. So Downers Grove, Long Grove, Buffalo Grove, those were all savannas originally. Uh, then on the east is Sown Woods. These are three of the greatest nature preserves I've ever seen. There's Sown Prairie, just a couple of views. And then we have, of course, Wolf Road Prairie over here at Wolf Road and 31st Street. I wish I could show you the little video of the fire they did there. Just look up on YouTube, uh, Wolf Road Prairie Fire, and you'll see some grown Footy, uh, video footage with Beethoven's Fifth Symphony playing, and it's a great video. Uh, but that's Wolf Road Prairie, and they have a Baroque savanna as part of that as well. West Chicago Prairie, I'm not even going to go over this map up here, but each of these little areas, it's a different soil type and a different kind of community. They're all jammed together in 600 acres. You know, we could go to some other place in the country, and in 600 acres, we don't get that many ecosystems jammed together. So go visit West Chicago Prairie. And we try to link these prairies up. So Hoosier Prairie's been safe for a while, Oak Ridge Prairie, and then they found these little islands in between. So the rest is all housing, but we can almost make kind of a mega preserve and they're doing that in other places as well. Forest then, let's move on to forest as we're marching through this thing. And so forests are gonna be almost 100% tree cover, except when there's been some kind of disturbance like this Michigan forest, Southwest Michigan forest that had a big blowdown in 20, which COVID year was it? 2020, that one happened. So they're gonna be watching that forest come back. But here's the big problem with forest and it's the same as savannas and woodlands, these Asian honeysuckles. So here's a picture, you could either call it November or April, doesn't matter. In November, the, our native trees have their leaves down, Asian honeysuckle doesn't have its leaves down. In April, Asian honeysuckle will have its leaves up and our leaves won't be out yet. So in November or April, if you go buy some woods and you see something like this, if you think for a moment, oh, doesn't that look beautiful? 
<laughs> oh, give yourself a little slap on the behind and say, that's horrible. That's all Asian honeysuckle and it's degrading the system massively. And we need workers of all kinds, helpers of all kinds to get rid of this stuff from there. We brought it over. I forgot how Asian honeysuckle came. I think it came in the garden trade and it went nuts here. Ambler flatwoods over by Michigan City is a collection of of flatwoods as you would expect. So that means the water table is near the surface in, the, in these flatwoods. Because it's close to Lake Michigan, that ameliorates the climate a little bit. So you get a lot of plants that grow way up in Canada that live there at Michigan City, Indiana and think they're in their home. <laughs> now the beautiful thing about Anvil flatwoods besides the woods is that every one of these little wet spots is botanically different. They're not clones of one another. So as you walk around and see them, you keep seeing different things in all the wetlands that are there. And you see old growth woods where the trees just died of old age, not due to any other human factor. And we can learn from these remnant natural areas, like I pointed out with the uh, bur oaks, that we can still learn a little bit, but we gotta do it before they're gone. So here in Amber Flatwood, we have some of these old, old, old reds. So let's keep red oak in mind. This one should be around 1800. And there's the conservation planning for Ambler Flatwoods. Uh, I'll come back to the red oak, but Messenger Woods in Will County. You want to go see some spring flowers? That's the place to go. Put it on your April list. There are marine nature preserve in Indiana, ancient 300 year old trees in there. Now let's look again. So here's marine nature preserve. We have some of those old red oaks again. Then we count, oh, they have a thousand acres at Moraine Nature Preserve, uh, conservation planning for them too. Now let's go to Ritchie Nature Preserve and we have some more of these in here, some more of these two, like right there, 200 plus year old red oaks in there. And here's another nature preserve with a 200 year old red oak in it. So we now have several uh, Indiana nature preserves in the same part of Chicago wilderness with 200 plus year old red oaks. Now red oaks don't need as much sunlight as bur oaks do. So they could get by on three hours perhaps of sunlight a day coming straight in unfiltered, but they prefer more. So we now know that most of our forest and woodland around 1800 had some openings in them. How did they have those openings? And there were natural factors still going on back then. Fire would have made some openings if it combined with drought. So maybe drought was stressing the trees plus fire. Maybe this, a couple of years earlier, there'd been a native insect outbreak that took down a bunch of leaves and weakened the trees. Maybe there's some storms. Passenger pigeons, you know, are extinct, but there used to be so many of them that they could break branches off. Uh, and so on. A whole bunch of natural factors and Native American factors used to operate in these forests and woodlands, and it would leave these openings. So we knew there were openings 1800, but then we don't allow those openings anymore. Smokey the bear doesn't allow the fire and so on. And oaks have a difficult time returning. So we have to skip the European style of managing things where we log things and graze cattle in our forest. We kill all the deer, then we allow too many deer to come in. And then we have all those non-native bugs that I mentioned. So the way we manage things now is to favor these and not these. And we got to get back to favoring the natural systems so that the forest can rejuvenate. Okay, let's leave the terrestrial realm and go to the wet ground. A special kind of wetland in Chicago wilderness is the fen. Forget the words. Let's go to a, my, my drawing here. This is an example for Springfield fen, but it could be Bluff Spring fen in Elgin. Uh, Lake of the Hills Fen in Lake County, at Illinois, I think. And basically you have an undulating landscape left over by the glaciers in there. But in, this, in these particular spots, just a few places around Chicago wilderness, the, the water comes percolating through the rocks and picks up a lot of calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate. And then that water is forced up in this depression area and these calcium and magnesium carbonates precipitate out as something called marl. So if you play words with friends or, or uh, Scrabble and someone puts mar down, you put an L on the end of it, another word, and hopefully get a whole bunch of points on it. But this marl is like chalk dust and it's wet. So it's like wet chalk dust. And then 
because the pH is not acidic, not neutral, it's basic, only certain plants can live there. And those plants die back and add dark organic matter. So the marl can have organic matter mixed in with it. So 18,000, let's call it 15,000 years ago, this calcium-based water's coming up, forming marl, special plants live there, and the soil just keeps growing up. Some of these fens have a marl mixed with organic soil from the floor of this room to the ceiling up there. Those are the biggest ones. So the soil has grown up that much. More often, it's like five or 10 feet, it happened. And thus the domes are getting big, the water isn't even through the edge. So you might have a prairie like condition here where there's not much water coming out. Over here, you have a lot of grasses. You have all different kinds of plants depending on how much the water is squeezing out in certain places. And then it squeezes out the side and you kind of have a regular old marsh growing there. So it's a whole different kind of wetland. And then there's a stream and there's another mound somewhere else. So here's Springfield Fen in Indiana. And this is in a graminoid dominated area of it. Now this one, these two pictures are the same place looking off. So here we have golden Alexanders here. Now golden Alexanders are, have a certain butterfly species, I've forgotten which one, that only eats golden Alexander. So you can't put your garden plants out there and that butterfly caterpillar eat them, only golden Alexander. So if you want that butterfly, you gotta have golden Alexander. Some kind of flocks there later in the year. And then a prairie Indian plantain, same view, just constantly changing. Now notice back here, there's a brown zone. So this is about five or 10 feet higher where we are than back there. So that's off the mound and a bunch of non-native plants invaded and the DNR got out and sprayed them to try to get rid of them. Again, restoration is needed everywhere. Okay, so here's a pen. Now look at the zonation again. A graminoid dominated area, a shrub dominated area. There's the stream going out. So you have a whole bunch of plant and wetland types throughout this fen. Some of them are, are again, they, they're, we call them calcifiles because they love so much calcium like these over here. Again, different zones in there giving us spectacular diversity. Here's a prairie patch on the fin and then there's a graminoid patch and then there's a rush patch back there. And when it's a dry year, sometimes the fins burn and we have to occasionally burn. Another rush patch back here and, and then some graminoids and calcifiles, all these micro variations. You can go to some places and walk for miles and never see this kind of variation. And that only poisonous snake in our area likes to live in fins. <laughs> but fins are so sensitive, we can't build walking trails through them. We, you can sometimes go near them. So if you go to uh, Bluff Spring Fen in Elgin or Lake of the Hills Fen or somewhere, try to get near them, but you can't walk in them unless you're the botanist who occasionally has to survey them to make sure they're healthy. Okay, I think this is I think this is our last habitat type, and then we wind up. Coastal plain marshes. They're most common in West Michigan, Southwest Michigan, and Northwest Indiana, but there's a few elsewhere. They're also common on the coastal plain of the United States. So the Carolinas and Georgia and North Florida have them. You can see the coastal plain marshes here and here. So what's the deal with them? I mentioned that some plants like to live in the Carolinas and here, they live almost nowhere else in between. How they got here from there is probably duck feathers. Some of the seeds got stuck in duck feathers and as they migrated north and landed in coastal, they, they brought them down and then, it, and then they, they like them. So what is a coastal plain marsh? They're usually on sand. And then there'll be some organic matter from the dead plants that have been living there for centuries or millennia. And occasionally fire comes through. But the thing that's special about coastal plain marshes are that the water level varies a lot more than most wetlands. Sometimes the water level starts off really high. It's almost like a lake. Other years it starts off with almost nothing. And then it goes up and down really fast. There's a couple of these along I-196 in Michigan. So if you if you go I-94 to Benton Harbor, St. Joe, and then don't go towards Detroit, keep going north. There's a couple of these uh, that you can see from the interstate. And sometimes before I knew about them, I would go by them and I go, how come those don't have nearly as much water as the other wetlands? Well, now I know coastal plain marshes fluctuate a lot more in water. And you'll guess it, that creates zones of plants. So here's a coastal plain marsh in South Carolina. 
Some years it's filled up almost the whole thing like a lake and then other years it has almost nothing. So this, uh, I forgot where this uh, coastal plain marsh is, but some years it's like a lake and you can't even see any plants. Other years it starts like this here. Look at the zones of plants that are found, found there as the water level goes down. Uh, Jasper Pulaski Fish and Wildlife Area, you may not be able to see it very well, but there's a whole bunch of them here in Northwest Indiana. And notice this rectangle is a little darker, they burned that in the year they took that, that photo. So another picture of a coastal plain marsh again, showing how much it goes down. Non-native Phragmites got in there, but the Nature Conservancy got after it and killed it. But then here's one that's drying up abnormally, in, I mean, really fast in a year. You just see different zones of plants as the water level goes down. And here we have ferns living a couple inches down from a bunch of grasses. It just shifts plant community in one step like that. And then there's specialists. I don't even know what this shrub is here, but Virginia Meadow Beauty is a specialist of, of coastal plain marshes. So here is a normal sort of swamp, buttonbush swamp. In, and these pictures were taken within a few days of each other. So it was dry last spring, if you follow the weather or check the river. Did you check the river levels? And uh, it was fairly dry last spring, but the, the, the swamp was almost full on water, but there wasn't a drop in the coastal plain marsh. Same day, practically. So you see the, the coastal plain marshes are much more erratic in their water and have a totally different plant species. So I promised you that'd be the end of, the, uh, of showing the different habitats, and I've been sprinkling the restoration throughout it. And I just want to emphasize in closing how much fun it is to get together with people. These are some of my classes all in pre-COVID years because we're so close together and, and, and not masked up. But we can get out there and do this stuff. Students can learn a ton about the natural world, go out, they can burn it up uh, like at our Preserve My Campus. And then some of these students go on and be major players in the, uh, in the restoration area. We have our little nature preserved by the campus here and it, and it has a, a zillion different little micro sites. So I get to do this whole fun thing that I've been describing for the last umpteen time in just 11 acres of ground. Uh, and the, the most common carnivorous plant, it just, it just showed up in our preserve. I didn't do anything special. And uh, you can do this at home too. You know, we have, I've seen, I haven't driven many of the roads in Riverside lately, but I know on Berry Point, there's one home, the Coonley House has an, a native planting by it. And I think there's, I'm sure there's other ones if I just wandered the streets of Riverside, but we can do this at home as well. And then I put your picture in from your sedge planting, which was stated from the website at, uh, over by Indian Gardens. And so I know, I think you put grazed sedge down. I'm, that's a perfect one for that kind of habitat. I didn't look at the full list. Now, I, I hope I can do this as I'm winding it down here. Let's see, can I, oh, wait a minute. Uh, this thing didn't advance here. Is there any way I could hit that Google thing that you know from, yeah, cause see, I'm still at the very beginning on yeah. here. Let's see here. That's why I keep looking at it every time I advance it. Cause I can't see it there. Right. See what we can do. Here. Oh yeah, I could. Yeah. For some reason, it's just not responding. To, oh, there, oh, you there go. we go. All yeah, right. go all the way, almost very bottom. Okay. And like this one. Yeah. And then you want to. And then, well, we're going to have to hit uh, current slide because yeah. we got to make that a big slide for okay. the for the. Uh, sure. Yeah, that, that is the current slide. But can we click the link? That's the yeah. Question. Oops, I'm editing it. Okay, hang on. Let me toggle on. over here. To... Try clicking there. I think we're going to get the arrow. Oh, no, it didn't move it in. You know what? Let's... It did it there, but it didn't do it up there. No, oh. so. But the, we could, what we were trying to do is go down to the Google car and then drive the Google car, believe it or not, drove in the gravel road to the scout cabin. I, I don't know what, if it had a driver, the guy was just looking for a lunch break. If it didn't have a driver, I don't know why it went down there. But anyway, when you go down that road, you see some Joe Pieweed growing, some woodland Joe Pieweed growing right by the trail. Now, there's one of two things going on. Somebody planted it there at some point, which I hope is not what happened. I hope it's a remnant. 
from that saying, but it tells us again, what is natural for that area near where you were restoring them. So then you go to the big book and pull out the woodland Joe pie weed and it lists 30 other plant species that naturally grow with it. So you know what else you can put in there and so many other areas there. It's my great thrill every, every even year autumn to take my restoration ecology class that I showed you there to Riverside to look at the dam removals and the stream remandering and then the vegetation along. And I'm gonna tell you, the kids love Riverside. We come to the little pastry shop there in the arcade building and they don't wanna leave. We've been here for five hours walking around and, and they go over there, get, it used to be a sandwich shop a bit before that. And then whatever, they, they just love to hang out here. And when they come back years later, they still tell me that the Riverside trip was their favorite one. And they can't believe that that mythical kind of town exists anywhere in their, in their life. But we could have gone down and driven in the Scout Cabin Road and we would have seen the Joe Pie Wheat there. And it does tell us what we could, it gives us a hint as to what we should put in those kind of areas. There in there. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can. Oops, I went past some of the Joe Pie Weed already. I'll try to find it again. Oops. Oh, nuts. I went a little too crazy there, but in any event, it's 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 a nice purple flower. It uh, that's that's that grows commonly along there, and it tells us what we can put in. But I've taken a lot of your time, and so I thank you all for coming by and, and paying attention. If anybody has any questions, wants to ask them, feel free to or talk to me afterwards. Do we have some time for questions? Yeah. yeah. Actually, I was just curious uh, uh, beyond the idea that these. Uh, multi sheet trees may suppress plants that are trying to get to the sun. What would the other negative consequences be, if any, when you have that kind of transformation where you're not looking at big, tall trees anymore? You've just got this kind of understory that's a lot of different shoots. Well, I mean, uh, the first time I really noticed it was the first time I did the restoration ecology class in 2012. We went to a savanna, and I'd never seen this sprouting before. And, and, I, and I made the students walk the whole way through so we could see if it was a problem throughout the 400 acres of the preserve, and it was. So there was no herbaceous grass layer, which is going to feed lots of butterflies and that kind of stuff and birds and that. I'm going to tell you the second thing, too. Because when we finished that class at two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm sure my students went home and took a shower right away. I did not take a shower till nine o'clock at night and I ended up with 500 chigger bites. So I'm wondering if those stump sprouts have fostered chiggers real bad. That's a personal negative thing I hate on that one. But it's, and the main thing is the reduction in the plant diversity because of the overshading. And, you know, and I noticed uh, another place where there was a whole bunch of white oak uh, sprouts coming up and, and I, at, at, a, at a hunting preserve in Indiana. And I asked the guy who's working on that, I said, well, you know, okay, so you have these farm plots within your hunting preserve to attract deer to come to. So that means the deer go for the free food and the turkeys go for the free food and they don't work hard to find the acorns. I think is what might happen. So too many acorns survive because of this kind of thing and they grow up into a million little shoots. Whereas 200 years ago, they would have mostly been eaten by deer, turkey and other animals. I think sometimes we, by our European management, allow too many acorns to grow in those kind of habitats. And then we, have, then we suffer with the stump sprouting for years. Whereas mother nature didn't play by that rule in the past. Any others? Any other, any other questions or sites you've seen in your favorite preserves around here that you want to share with, with us? Any others? Well, if, come up, if you're shy and bashful, come up and we, we can talk about them. Otherwise, thanks again for having me come back to Riverside after all these years. Thank you so much. <laughs> you're welcome.